Greetings. Welcome to Belimo Energy Valve, making systems energy efficient, easier to control, and more transparent. Presented by HPAC Engineering Magazine and sponsored by Belimo. I'm Scott Arnold, Executive Editor of HPAC Engineering. Before we begin, a few words about this webinar technology. This newer platform allows you to be more involved with presentations and, more importantly, allows you to watch events the way you want to watch them. For starters, you can customize your console. You can move windows by dragging on the title bar and resize them by clicking on the lower right corner. You will notice a toolbar at the bottom of your console. The buttons there allow you to open and close widgets on your screen. On your console, the Blimo logo is hotlinked. If you want to visit the company's website during this webcast, click on the logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the webinar. This webinar will conclude with a live question and answer session. You can submit a question to at any time during the event. To do so, simply type it into the Q&A box and then click the Submit button. During our session, feel free to tweet your thoughts and impressions of the presentation to your followers using the Twitter widget. We appreciate your feedback. Please click the survey icon at the left of the toolbar and take a moment to complete the form. Lastly, if during the presentation you experience technical difficulties, such as problems with the audio or the advancing of slides, please refresh your webinar console by pressing the F5 key on your keyboard. Now, let's meet our presenter. As an application consultant for Belimo, David Candell spends a bulk of his time supporting consulting and facilities engineers and teaching about products and applications in the area of hydronics. He spent the early part of his career designing control valves for Belimo, including the company's first generation pressure independent valve. He has bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Rochester. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Candell. Thank you, Scott, and thanks to everybody for joining us today for our webinar on the Belimo Energy Valve. Uh, the Energy Valve is a very interesting product that I'm excited to talk with you about, but we're going to spend the first portion of this seminar really talking a little bit more about systems and some of the problems that we run into and that will lead us <clears throat> into some of the solutions that the Energy Valve can provide. Let's take a look at how our webinar is going to lay out today. We're going to start by talking about how hydronic systems don't always match the building, excuse me, why hydronic system design doesn't always match the uh, building performance. Then we'll talk a little bit about the balancing process of buildings, uh, and we'll discuss things like valve authority and how they affect the way that water moves through buildings. We'll talk a little bit about coils and heat transfer, and then at the end we'll go ahead and talk about energy valve. So now that I've laid out a whole bunch of very sciencey and probably boring sounding topics, let's see if we can go ahead and make these interesting for you guys. Let's get started by talking a little bit about how we model the energy consumption of buildings uh, before we build them. Um, we'll talk about the software eQuest here, which is a Department of Energy uh, platform. Uh, but a lot of the private companies that make energy modeling softwares use some of the same types of modeling assumptions that steer us a little bit awry when we actually go build the building. So I'm going to point out three things in specific today. The first thing I'll point out is already listed here on the screen. The assumption made by these softwares is that all of your valves have been sized properly. Now, um, I would estimate in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 percent of valves are oversized when they go into buildings. And I will show you in a minute how that happens. The second assumption that's made is that all system pressures are stable. Most of these softwares are somewhat static in terms of how system pressure is modeled. Um, and so within the software, we assign a pressure drop to a given control valve, and then we make an assumption of flow based on that. But obviously in real life, the system uh, pressure or the differential pressures that are affecting the valve and the flow through it vary as, as the system changes. And so that's not always necessarily a good model. And then the third assumption is that all valves have perfect valve authority. And we'll discuss valve authority a little bit later on, but just to give you an idea to start thinking about it, the assumption that all valves have perfect valve authority is the assumption that all valves uh, behave exactly the same regardless of where they are in our hydronic system. So if our control valves or, or really any of our equipment is very close to where we're pumping, they're likely to see much higher pressures and much higher differential pressures than, say, the, the valves or equipment that is much further down the run. Um, and the assumption is made that those two pieces of equipment or two valves would behave the same, and that's a, a fairly poor assumption. Let's, let's start with the first one where we said that all valves 
our sized property. Let's take a look at how we would size a standard control valve. If you've ever done this, this formula will look familiar to you. If you haven't, it's not terribly difficult. Standard control valves are sized by something called C sub V or flow coefficient. And the flow coefficient is uh, calculated by taking the GPM requirement of the coil and dividing by the square root of the designed pressure drop. So if we do an example here, we'll say we have a good size air handler coil at 250 gallons a minute. And maybe the specification says something like the delta P of the valve should not exceed 5 PSI. So I'm going to go ahead and size this valve, and I'm going to size it using 4 PSI only because it makes the math simpler. And frankly, that's very common in the industry uh, because no one quite knows the square root of 5 off the top of their head, but everybody seems to be able to manage the square root of 4. So 250 gallons a minute divided by the square root of 4 gives me a, C, uh, a CB of 125. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my valve catalog, and I'm going to find a CB of 125. And here is a cut from the Belimo catalog, and you could go get any other valve manufacturer's catalog, and you'll see something similar, is that you can get a 3-inch valve with a flow coefficient of 90, or you can get a 4-inch valve with a flow coefficient of 170. But there really isn't a valve for 125. In fact, most of the time we're sizing valves, we come up with a flow coefficient number that falls somewhere between one valve and another. And then we have to decide, should we take the smaller valve or should we take the larger valve? Now, your gut instinct's probably telling you, hey, we should take the, the larger valve because that's going to be more conservative. We won't ever starve that coil if we take a larger valve. But we can actually figure out using what's written in the specification which valve we need to take. So the specification says that we can't have more than 5 PSI. So let's recalculate the C sub Z formula and solve it for delta P. And then we'll plug in the value of these two valves and we'll see what the pressure drops we get for each one. So if we take the smaller valve and plug that into this formula, we will get 250 gallons a minute divided by the, the flow coefficient of 90, and we'll square that up, and you'll see that we need almost 8 PSI to get 250 gallons a minute through that 3-inch valve. Well, that violates our specification. So let's go ahead and take a look then at the other valve. And obviously with the larger valve, uh, we have 250 gallons a minute divided by the flow coefficient of 170 and square that up, and then we get only... 2.2 PSI differentials required. And so by the way that the specification is written, we are going to select the valve that has the lower pressure drop. So we're going to take that larger valve by our gut instinct, but we're also going to take that larger valve because the spec says we have to. So we're all in agreement that we should take the larger valve. The problem is, is that the less pressure allocated to that valve, the less control I have over it. So I've inadvertently given up some of my controllability by selecting this larger valve. Let's take our oversized valve and put it in our building. And for this uh, demonstration, we're going to say there's basically three ways we could pipe that control valve. We could put it next to the coil with no balancing device. I hope nobody's designing their buildings that way. The reality is that there are buildings that have been built that way, so we'll talk about it. The second option would be to couple the control valve with a balancing valve, and then the third option would be to use some kind of flow-limiting uh, balancing valve or an automatic balancing valve. or uh, All of these terms sort of refer to the similar types of devices, uh, so we could use that. So let's take a look at each one of these scenarios and see what kind of trouble we can get ourselves into. So the diagram you see on the right side of your slide, uh, we, we will use several times during the presentation. So I'll just take a minute here to explain what you're looking at. In the bottom center, we're pumping water to the left out of uh, our pump, as the arrow indicates. And this is what's known as a re direct return piping system. And that means that the highest pressure water hits the first zone first and then travels through the rest of the building, losing pressure as it travels further on and the lowest return water pressure will also be at that first zone. So the first zone, as displayed here, has a very high differential pressure. We've picked a fairly random number of 35 PSI, but a larger number than the other zones to represent the pressure drop in that first zone. 
Now the other coil and valve combination you see would be the farthest uh, loop in that, in that building, or, or it could be a campus. It, it doesn't have to be specific. So we've just sort of drawn dotted lines in between the, the closest zone and the furthest one away, and we will just examine those two zones. So you can see here my close zone has a large pressure drop of 35 PSI. My far zone has a much lower pressure drop, in this case, of only 8 PSI. So now my control valve is oversized based on the way we did sizing, and so that zone that's furthest away will have a moderate overflow, but I could probably re, uh, readjust my pressure drop in that zone to get my flows correct. Um, so the oversized valve may cause a little bit of an overflow problem, but frankly that zone that's the furthest one away in this case will be relatively well behaved. Now it is a pressure dependent control valve, so I do not have any uh, protection against pressure fluctuations in that zone, but in general that's a well behaved zone, even without a balancing valve and even with an oversized control valve. Now that close zone gets me into a lot of trouble right off the bat because now I have a lot of extra pressure and I have a tremendously oversized control valve and there's nothing I can do to prevent this valve from overflowing almost immediately when I open it. Now this system has no balancing devices in it and so we didn't expect it to be very well behaved and so it wasn't and that was kind of what we were expecting. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a more common scenario where we have now put a balancing valve in each one of our loops. And so we have, again, 35 PSI on our close zone. In this case, we'll say it's 10 PSI in the far zone. That gives us a couple extra PSI so that we can use that balancing valve to dial in our flows. Now, with the balancing valve in place, I'm going to have some minor valve authority issues with my oversized control valve, but I shouldn't have any overflows up there at full flow. And I have no protection from pressure changes. Again, the balancing, uh, balancing valve is a static device, so it will, can get us um, dialed in when we have, during the balancing process, but when pressures fluctuate in the system, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't protect us from that. So we don't have protections from pressure changes. In our closer zone, again, we could dial in the max flow rate, so we won't be overflowing at a full flow or full load condition but we're going to have major valve authority problems in this close zone, which means we're going to have a highly unstable control loop. So I'm not real happy with that solution either. Let's go ahead and install the flow limiting device in each one of our zones. And when we do this, this is a more advanced device, so this hopefully will give us better performance. Our far zone, again, minor valve authority problems. I don't have any protection from pressure changes below full flow, so this valve will prevent me from overflowing the full flow value of that coil. It will not prevent me from overflowing partial flow values. But again, that far zone is probably pretty well behaved no matter what we're doing up there. But again, closer to where we are in the pump, we're going to, again, have major valve authority problems, so highly unstable control loop. And again, no pressure fluctuations when we're below full flow on that valve. So regardless of how we've piped this valve, we've created uh, quite a bit of problems uh, with our, our oversized valve. But we, we frankly would run into a lot of these same problems even if we had sized that valve correctly. And so I think the next important step to look at would be how the dynamic and static balancing process looks in a building. So we talked about valve authority a bunch of times. So let's go ahead and take a look at that and let's just define it right off the bat. Um, the valve authority is defined as the pressure drop of the control valve divided by the entire pressure drop of the branch. Um, so a simple way to think about it is of the entire branch, what percent of pressure is allocated to the control valve? Um, if I could have 40 or 50 percent of my pressure allocated to my control valve, that's what ASHRAE would define as a favorable valve authority. Uh, so that would give me a valve authority of 0.4 or 0.5. So just imagine that that delta P across the branch was that far branch where I had a, a, a 10 PSI pressure drop across the entire branch, then I would allocate 4 or 5 PSI to my control valve to get the valve authority in that favorable range. The issues would come into place is that if I had, a, say, a 20 or 30 PSI pressure drop across the branch, uh, 
well, 50 or 40 or 50 percent of the pressure drop of 30 PSI starts to become a fairly large uh, pressure drop to allocate for a valve, and so that valve gets smaller and smaller, um, and that's not exactly how we always want to design the buildings either. So let's go back to the model of our building. Um, in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a balancing process. And we're going to call this static balancing. And we call it static balancing because we're going to use standard static balancing type devices. So I said earlier that that balancing valve was indeed a static device because we set it one time and it never adjusts itself through the life of the building. Um, and so we'll call this a static balancing process. So we're going to simplify the pressure numbers here because we're going to start playing with the numbers. But we'll say our first zone closest to where we're pumping has a 20 PSI pressure drop. And the far zone it has a 10 PSI pressure drop. Now, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to make the assumption that the coil or the air handler in each one of these zones is identical and all of the control valves are identical. So we're assuming we have identical zones throughout this building. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and balance that far loop. So assuming that the coil takes about a four pound pressure drop at full flow, and the control valve is designed and sized properly at a four PSI pressure drop, then I will adjust the balancing valve in that far loop until my flows work out. And when I do that, it will take approximately a two PSI pressure drop so that I have accounted for the 10 PSI in that loop. So I have a fairly low branch differential, and then I have a fairly low pressure drop across my balancing device. When I get down to my close loop, I'm going to have the same coil and the same control valve, and so I'm still going to allocate 4 PSI to each of those. But I'm going to have to do a lot more balancing on my balancing valve because I have a substantial, substantially higher pressure in this loop. And so I'm going to have to accommodate for 12 PSI in order to get my flows to work out here. And so in zones where I have higher branch differential or higher differential across the entire loop, I'm going to have to ac account for more of that pressure through the balancing valve. Now let's think about the term we used before to describe this. We said this was valve authority. Well, when I say valve authority, the word authority is in there for a reason. The item that has the most pressure allocated to it is the item that's going to have the most authority or control or influence over the behavior. So when I look at that top zone, my control valve has authority. It has 40% valve authority, and therefore it's going to have the biggest influence over what happens in the loop. But in the closed loop, the, close, the loop close to where I'm pumping, my balancing by the valve actually has a 60% authority, and it is going to have a much greater impact over the control than actually the control valve does. And so this is obviously not a desirable situation. In order to understand how we're going to get into trouble, let's take a look at how balancing valves work. So on the left side of your screen is an example of a manually adjusted balancing device, and on the right side is a tube that we will just call a piece of pipe. And the piece of pipe is representing a balancing valve that's fully open. We're going to use this as an example because let's just say that when the balancing valve is fully open, it takes relatively no pressure drop. It's going to take a small pressure drop, but we'll say it takes almost no pressure drop. So the pipe is essentially unrestricted. And the way the balancing valve works is it works by creating a restriction in the pipe and by pushing 100% of the water through a smaller opening, it costs us some pressure, or it costs us energy in the form of pressure. So if I can get this to animate here, what we're going to do is to get the 12 PSI pressure drop we want, we're going to adjust that handle. And when we do that, the opening in the pipe essentially shrinks. So I'm going to take all that water, same amount of water, and I'm going to push it through a smaller area. And when I do that, it costs me this 12 PSI of pressure. The problem with the static balancing device, with the manual balancing valve, is that it requires the high flow to create that much pressure drop. So here's the question. What happens if I only have 20% of the flow? That reduced area, that small opening, 
is not small compared to only one-fifth of the amount of water. And so I don't get a 12-pound pressure drop anymore. In order to get that 12-pound pressure drop, I need all of the water. And now I just have a small portion of it. And so the pressure that is consumed by this device is much lower than the value that we designed around. So you can see here this is a static device, and we balance at a very specific condition. In fact, we balance buildings at a condition we kind of hope they never get to. We're going to turn our pumps up to 100%. We're going to open all the control valves. The building may not even be loaded when we're balancing the building. And so that is the condition. That's sort of the worst thing that can happen to the building. And it'll be in pretty good balance when that happens. But we operate our buildings the whole rest of the year in these sort of part load modulating conditions. And this is a little bit more of what you would see at those times of the year. Even our automatic balancing valve is a static device. In fact, when we purchase these devices or we design around them, they have specified GPM values. So for my 250 gallon a minute coil that we spoke about earlier, I'm going to buy a flow limiting valve that does 250 gallons a minute. But what happens below 250 gallons a minute? What does this device do if I only need 80 gallons a minute? And the answer is not much. So that device has trouble at flow rates below its full rate. It doesn't have trouble. It just doesn't do anything. So at 80 GPM, this device is not creating much resistance. So if I only need 80 GPM, it could creep up to 90 or 100 or 140 or 170. And this device, which is designed for 250, might not take much pressure drop or much resistance. Again, it is a static device. Now, this is an, an excellent device from the standpoint that it simply will not allow more than 250 gallons a minute to flow through it, and so it has its place in systems, but it is indeed a simple and static device. One of the great misconceptions in our industry is that if I take a standard control valve and I put an automatic balancing valve next to it, that I get the behavior of a pressure independent valve, and that simply isn't true. The only time that's true is if it's a two position. If you don't care what happens between no flow and full flow, then this is a great device for you. Uh, but if you're in a modulating application, it could get you into some trouble. So now that we understand that a little bit better, let's go back to our building and turn everything down to 20%. So we're going to turn our pumps down to 20%, and we're going to say we're trying to achieve roughly 20% of the flow through our coils. Now, I still have 10 PSI at my far loop. I have not reset my differential pressure based on my reduced pumping. Of course, we could do that. We're going to ignore that for now. So as we look at it, at 10 PSI, excuse me, at 20% flow rate in the far zone, I'm not going to get 4 PSI pressure drop on that coil anymore. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'll just call it less than 4 because I don't want to move too many numbers around at the same time. Now, the balancing valve was supposed to take 2 PSI when we balanced it. Maybe it takes 1. It probably takes really close to 0. Um, so what happens to all this extra pressure? The answer to that is the only device that's in there that doesn't consume a specific amount of pressure based on the flow is the control valve. Indeed, the control valve will produce a specific amount of flow based on the pressure drop. So I have overpressurized my control valve. I've done it very minorly, and I'm going to have a small overflow. Again, we talked quite a bit previously about how this far zone is fairly stable, and I'm not terribly worried about its performance, and I'm not here. When I get to my closer zone, though, we said this is the one that's going to have a problem, and here's where the problem comes into play. Again, we're going to have less than a four-pound pressure drop on the coil. We're going to have maybe only one or two PSI pressure drop on that balancing device, and we were counting on that balancing device to take a 12-pound pressure drop. And so at this reduced flow rate, or what we were hoping would be a reduced flow rate, we now have 14 PSI when we were looking for 4 PSI. And so I'm going to have a substantial overflow at that point. I'm going to have more than twice as much water going through that coil than I really wanted to have. So you can see when we put buildings into a static balance type design, and we put these static devices in, they work great in in the condition in which the building was balanced. But once we start using them for real, we run into some troubles. 
In order to really get our buildings to be behave like the models we made about them, we need to engage in what we call a din dynamic balancing process. And dynamic balancing means I'm going to put devices in place that will adjust to the changes in flows and pressures. So if I put a pressure independent valve in each loop, and notice that the pressure independent valve doesn't have any balancing device with it, that would not be required. I can get the exact GPMs that I want, regardless of what goes on in the rest of the system, regardless of the pressure in that loop, regardless of the setting of my pump, I'm still gonna get the flow rate I want in each and every one of my zones. Essentially what the pressure independent type valve does, it creates a dynamically balanced system and it essentially isolates each zone from the other ones. So when zones one, two, three, four, and five all close down, zone six is still able to maintain the proper flow rates to heat or cool those spaces. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit and let's talk about heat transfer and we'll talk a little bit about how coils work. Now, what you're looking at on this curve here is you're looking at a typical coil curve and a typical delta T curve. So the blue curve is increasing flow rate from left to right across the graph. And then um, from, on the left-hand axis, we're increasing the power output or heat exchange of that coil. So that could be in BTUs per hour or it could be in tons of cooling or however you like. And the interesting thing about that curve, and I'm sure you noticed it right off the bat, is that it's not linear. There is not a linear relationship between water into the coil and how much heat is transferred. In fact, at low flows, you can see the curve is quite steep, and at high flows, you can see it's quite flat. Well, the steeper the curve is, in this case, the more efficient the heat transfer is. But heat transfer should be more efficient at low flows in a coil. Let's think about how a coil actually works. A coil is essentially a long piece of copper tube that we bent around, maybe put fins on it or what have you, but it's, it's essentially a piece of tube. And if I took some cold water and I put it really slowly through that tube, I would be able to absorb a lot of heat as it traveled through that coil. So the heat transfer is quite efficient. And that leads into the delta T curve. The delta T is much higher, as you see here at the low flows, because that water that went in nice and cold is going to come out sort of lukewarm on the other side because it absorbed so much heat. Now, if we look at the other end of the curves, where the coil curve starts to flatten out at the end. Well, now I have a huge volume of water. I don't just have a few molecules of water. I have a, a, a billion molecules of water, a big number. I don't know how much. But all that water is racing through the coil, and each molecule of water only spends a few seconds inside that coil, and so each one can't absorb as much heat. Now I have a billion molecules, so it can absorb a lot of total heat, but each one's sort of less efficient. And so the delta T starts to diminish. The cold water comes in, and it comes out the other side cool, but maybe not lukewarm. So I've done a lot of cooling, but I haven't done it as efficiently. So that's why that curve has this shape. Now, if we're trying to control that shape, we wouldn't be terribly happy with that, because that would be a difficult shape to sort of control. And so we're going to add another line to this graph here. We're going to add the control valve. Now the control valve has a different set of axes. The control valve is increasing the control signal across the x-axis from left to right. So I'm increasing how much, how, how open the valve is. And then I'm going to have an increase in flow rate across up the y-axis. So what you can see is that control valves are designed to open very slowly to counteract the fast-acting nature of the coil. Now, if I could cancel out, you'll see I have flow on both axes. If I cancel out flow, I could get a relationship between the control signal and the power uh, of the coil or the heat transfer capability. And what we're trying to do is get a resulting coil output that's a linear relationship between the control signal and how much heat transfer we have. So by sizing a control valve and a coil equal and opposite of one another, we can get that nice behavior. Let's take a look at a live, well, it's not live, but a real uh, coil curve. So here's some data that came off of a coil. And you can see it has that same kind of shape. It's much steeper. Um, 
at low flows and starts to flatten out at the top. And obviously, all of these curves are not really curves. They're a sequence of data that's collected, and then we can best fit a curve in there. So that's the flow and BTUH. And that heat exchange is governed by a fairly simple formula. We have the power output in BTUH, we'll call Q. And that's equal to 500 times the, the flow rate times the delta T. And so the, the heat exchange is a function of fluid velocity and delta T. So let's take a look at the delta T on here, too. We can put that on there. So this is from the same uh, measured coil. So again, we added the delta T axis on the right side of the graph. And you can see it has that same shape we modeled earlier. It's, it's relatively uh, high delta T's as the flows are low. And then as we increase those flows, they come down. So if you're looking closely at my data, you can see that I chopped it off at about 55 gallons a minute because I really like this curve the way that it is. The problems can come into play when I add more water to a coil uh, that really doesn't need it to achieve the cooling in the space. And this would be true for hot water coils, too. This particular coil just happens to be a, cold, a chill water coil. So let me go ahead and release the rest of that info here. The rest of the data comes in, and you can see I went from 55 to 65 gallons a minute, and three bad things happened to me. The first thing was I had to pump that extra 10 gallons a minute. I had to pump more water. As I went from 55 to, say, 65 gallons a minute, my delta T went from around 12 degrees Fahrenheit to around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll notice that my curve completely flattened out. In fact, it looks on average that I didn't produce any more BTUs despite adding an extra 10 gallons a minute. So of these three things, the third one is the one that's kind of the most troubling. If I don't produce any more BTUs despite adding more resources, how do I know I have a problem? In fact, if I don't change the BTU output, the things that we commonly measure in buildings like discharge air temperature from our air handler or from our, our VAV, or perhaps we're measuring room temperature in the space, well, that temperature, that air temperature doesn't change any faster or slower because I'm producing the same amount of BTUs at 55 gallons a minute that I was at 65 gallons a minute. And so the response from our system is no different. Let's take a look at two points on this graph and showed something else that's a little bit alarming. I picked a point here that's at about 275,000 uh, BTU H, and I could draw a line horizontally through the data. That horizontal line represents all the different flow rates that produced 275,000 BTU H. That means at some point I used about 32 gallons a minute, and at some point I used about 45, 47 gallons a minute, and it and all of those produce the same amount of cooling in that space. I can, oops, I can take a look at a curve here that is not nearly as clean as the previous one and show a much greater problem. I'm going to take a similarly partially loaded point here and extrapolate that line. Now, on the previous curve, I could tell you that the horizontal line had some width to it, but that that was due to relatively normal system conditions. Maybe we mixed in a bunch of outside air, or we had an increase in humidity, or we had a, a relatively prompt shift in loading, and it, it caused us to use a little bit more or a little bit less water. What actually really happened was that we produced the same amount of cooling uh, at a different delta T, and so that curve widened out. On this one here, Right about 60 gallons a minute or so, everything else to the right there is what we call the waste zone or an area in that heat exchange that we really didn't need to get into in order to satisfy that space. And those are the types of places that we could really save some energy by avoiding going into these extreme low delta T areas in our heat transfer. Now, it's a common thing to not know that we have such difficulties with our coils and to not know that we're expending extra water resources and not getting a commensurate amount of heat exchange advantage. Here's one more coil data I want to look at, and this one's a big mess. 
But there's a couple of interesting spots to look at. The first one I want you to look at is right here. So notice in this case, um, we're at about 130, 140 kilobeats used per hour. There's sort of a dark cluster right there. And then I look at this other dark cluster right here. And in this case, that's about 150 or so kilobeats used per hour, um, somewhere in that ballpark. So we made a relatively moderate increase in our cooling on this coil, but we used almost twice as much water to do it up there. And this is because we're forcing inefficient heat transfers. We're just saying, oh, well, you know what? It's hot in there right now. Throw 50 gallons a minute at it. The reality is, is that there's plenty of places in the 30 to 40 gallon a minute range where we're able to achieve the same amount of cooling output, but we just let this coil kind of run wild on itself. All right, so we've laid out a few problems in terms of understanding how we have valve potential issues with valve sizing and the valve authority, and we talked a little bit about coil stuff. Let's go ahead and talk about why the energy valve can help avoid some of these problems. Now, Belimo's really excited because uh, in about a month or so, a little, no, just in a couple of weeks, we're going to release Energy Valve 3.0. And that is a, the obviously the third generation Energy Valve, and we're real excited about this product. If you were able to stop by our booth at the AHR show um, out in Las Vegas, you were able to get a little preview of this, but let's show you now what's going on. Now, if you're not familiar with the Energy Valve at all, let me explain what it is, it is essentially a, an electronically pressure independent valve with a fully integrated BTU meter. So it's a control valve. We have a flow meter strapped uh, in line, excuse me, it's not strapped, it's piped in line with the valve. And then we have temperature sensors. So we're measuring the temperature before and after uh, the coil. So we're measuring flow, we're measuring delta T, we can use that formula we talked about earlier, and that's how we have ourselves a BTU meter. Now we're doing a bunch of interesting things uh, with the flow and delta T measurements that we're doing. Let's take a look at some of the big functions of the energy valve, and then we could talk about how they implement. Now across the bottom, we already kind of talked about pressure independent control and hydronic balancing. Uh, all Belimo energy valves are based on ball valve technology when Belimo loves the ball valve because we get that nice tight close off with 0% linkage, uh, excuse me, leakage. And so all energy valves, all ANSI 125 energy valves are ball valves. We have a few uh, 250, ANSI 250 models that utilize other technologies, but we're migrating all of those over to ball valves in the next time to come. Let's start across the top though. Let's talk about one of the great energy saving features that the Belimo Energy Valve has, and that is the Delta T Manager, or the ability to do Delta T Management. What we're going to do with Delta T Management is we're going to force the valve and coil to operate at a higher thermal heat transfer efficiency rate. In English, what that means is we're going to try to figure out the least amount of water we need to use to heat or cool a particular space. So let's take our pretty clean coil that we had before. The Delta T manager, what it will do is it will operate as the control signal asks for in all conditions, except it's going to set a low limit allowable for Delta T. So in the case we're looking at here, let's say I set a Delta T low limit of 12 degrees Fahrenheit. What's going to happen is if I overflow this valve, if my Delta T drops below that 12 degrees Fahrenheit point, the valve will suspend the control signal and it will start to reduce its own flow. So when it does that, we're going to have a reduction in flow. The delta T will start to creep back up that curve until it reaches the 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we've selected the delta T appropriately, we won't see any diminishing of the ability to transfer heat. So if your thought is, hey, what about occupant comfort? Suddenly your valve is restricting flow to the coil. Remember what we talked about. The three problems that we had when we reached an overflow with low delta T and increased pumping, but we did it while not producing any more BTUs. So if I could reduce the pumping and increase the delta T, I shouldn't lose any BTUs when I do that. Now, we have to be 
appropriate when we select a delta t. If we go back to our curve here, I can't decide suddenly that I want 16 or 18 degrees of delta t out of this particular coil because it's never going to get there. Well, we can get it to 18 degrees of delta t, but I promise you, you can't cool your space while I'm doing it. Let's take a look at the cost of this overpumping. Remember we said something about 55 and 65 gallons a minute earlier. Let's take a look at those two points. So the first point does 55 gallons a minute. If we draw our line across, it's at about 320 kilobtus per hour. The second point is 10 gallons a minute more and about 5,000 more BTUH. So I've made a relatively small increase in my ability to cool that space and a fairly large cost in terms of pumping. So if we look at it mathematically, we increased our BTU output by less than 2%, and we did it at an 18% increase to the flow rate. So what does it cost us to pump 18% more water? Well, if you're familiar with the pump affinity laws or the fan affinity laws on the air side, you know that there's a, a cubic relationship between the increase in flow and the increase in pump horsepower is required to achieve that flow. So that 18% increase in flow theoretically would cost us 65% more pumping horsepower. Well, that starts to become a number we want to pay attention to. Now, this is just one coil in a system, but let's just say you had a central plant distribution system and you knew that your delta T was, was a little on the low side. Well, according to pump affinity, if you could figure out how to reduce your flow rate by just 10%, you could reduce your pumping costs in the entire system by upwards of 25% based on pump affinity calculations. So it's certainly something to investigate. What about on the plant side? When we start talking about savings, we need to understand where the savings are come from. Well, all chillers are more efficient at their design delta T than they are at low delta T. How much more efficient is really going to depend on the age and technology uh, that is inside of your compressor within your chiller. So the newer, more high-tech, advanced chillers have less of an impact from delta T. As recently as five or 10 years ago, that vintage of chillers has a, a significantly higher impact on delta T, and then chillers older than that have just horrendous performance at low delta T. The other thing that can come about from low delta T, though, is we can wind up using more equipment than we want to or than we need to because we have the low delta T. Let's take a look at a simple example. Let's say I have a plant that has two chillers in it, and each chiller is 500 tons, and let's just say I have a 500 ton load right now that's being addressed by one of my chillers. I could take the formula on the left to calculate how much water I need to run through that chiller in order to get the 500 tons. And you can see we have 500 tons times 24, and we're going to use a 12 degree delta T on this particular plant. And we'll say that I need 8,000 gallons a minute going through one of my chillers as long as I can produce a 12 degrees delta T. Well, an interesting thing about delta T and flow, we looked at that formula earlier, and this one tells us the same thing. You see that flow and delta T are what's known as inversely proportional. So if one of them decreases, the other one has to increase proportionately to get all the numbers to work out. So even if I still have a 500 ton load, if I only have eight degrees of delta T in this plant, I now need 1,500 gallons a minute to satisfy the same load. And very likely the pump that's in line with the one of my chillers doesn't have an extra 50% capacity. And therefore, we're probably going to stage that second chiller, not because we need more cooling necessarily, but because we need more flow rate. And this is a problem that you can see in your facilities that have multiple chillers. You will wind up staging more chillers than you need. And if you can get your delta T under control, we can eliminate that. Let's take a look at a couple of other features on the energy valve, and we'll take a look at a couple of case studies, and then we can take some questions. So real quickly, we have the monitoring capabilities of the energy valve. So I told you that it's a BTU meter. Well, sure enough, it, uh, it is, and we can get that full information, and we can communicate pretty much any way you want. So it has full BACnet capability, and it is in, has an integrated web server, so you can put it on your IP network. Energy valve 3 will also include 
Modbus communication. So Modbus TCP IP or RTU is now available or will be available with Energy Valve 3. Obviously, if you don't have any of these types of communications within your building, the Energy Valve operates like a standard control valve. You give it a 2 to 10 volt signal, you give it a 0 to 10 volt signal, it's going to operate just fine. You want to go get your data, you can physically go to the valve, you can plug some Cat5 cable into it, and you can download a year's worth of data. Actually, 13 months of data is stored locally on the energy valve. You can go out to that valve once a year and pull all your data down. The other nice part about the web server, <coughs> if you have your valve networked, you can log into it from anywhere on your network, and you can get an immediate update to the status of what's going on. So the splash screen you see here is a sample of what you would see. So you can see your inlet and outlet temperature, how much power is being produced, current flow rates, uh, current valve position. And we can even do some valve analysis on that. So within that same web server platform, you can start taking a look at your coil curves and your delta T responses. And these curves, uh, excuse me, these software tools uh, have a built-in capability to try to determine the most efficient delta T set point you could make based on the data that you have. So there's a lot of options available through our, the current Energy Valve 3 web server. And one last feature that we want to talk about that Belimo's real excited about, the new Energy Valve 3 will have a full cloud services available. So a full suite of services available through the Belimo cloud. The Belimo cloud will include things like the ability to output your data and request that Belimo does an optimization of your current data to figure out optimum delta T set points and flow settings and other parameters on your valve. You can request regular performance reports from Belimo. We will also store your data free on our cloud server for the lifetime of that product. They're free uh, software updates and the ability to have online support. So you're having difficulty with your valve if it's on the cloud. Uh, Belimo Tech Support representative can log into your valve and help you get all your settings squared away. And as an incentive with Energy Valve 3, Belimo is offering an additional two years warranty on any Energy Valve that's connected to the Belimo Cloud. So you'll actually have a seven years warranty on the Belimo Energy Valve. So again, coming with Energy Valve 3.0 is a full suite of cloud services. Uh, obviously, we'd be happy to discuss this more with you uh, if anybody has interest in cloud services, contact your local Belimo person and we'll get in touch with you. A couple of quick case studies and then we'll get to the questions. Uh, first, Belimo did a case study about, uh, oh gosh, it's almost 10 years ago now um, with MIT. It was while we were developing the original energy valve, uh, we, we did a study at the Hayden Library at the MIT University, which is up in Boston, if you're not familiar with it. It's approximately 150,000 square foot building. It was built in the 1940s, uh, and when it was built originally, it had a six degree delta T screw chiller in the building for the, its cooling. Sometime uh, across the years, MIT built a chilled water plant and a distribution piping system to all the buildings, so they took that six degree chiller out. The problem was that all of the buildings still had six degree coils on most of their air handlers, and so, not surprisingly, they got an average delta T of six. But when all of those valves were replaced by the Belimo energy valve, we were able to force a higher level of heat transfer in each of those coils. In fact, we were able to get 12 degrees of coil, uh, excuse me, 12 degrees of heat transfer out of those coils. And so, if you look at six degrees to 12 degrees, what that means, remember, flow and delta T are inversely proportional. So if we double the delta T, we're actually cooling the building the same amount with half as much water. So we cut the flow rate in half and doubled the delta T. Uh, there's a really excellent paper written by a professor at the University of Colorado named Gregor Henza, uh, and it is a, a paper describing what happened during this case study. This, is, this paper is available on energyvalve.com if you're interested in downloading a copy of this paper. And when I say it's interesting, it's like interesting in an ASHRAE journal kind of way. It's a very sciencey paper. It's not a, a marketing piece from Belimo by any stretch. Uh, 
Let's take a look at one other thing. There's a large technical company down in North Carolina uh, that did a case study involving the Belimo energy valve. And so they put, an ener they put a bunch of energy valves in one building and were doing some studies. And in, in fact, all the data on this graph came from a single energy valve installed on one air, air handler. So what you're looking at across the bottom of this axis from left to right is the loading in the space. So it's the tons of cooling required uh, during the time period where we measured. And across the, uh, excuse me, on the vertical axis on the left is the measured chilled water delta T of that coil. So we're just measuring load and delta T. And the different clusters of points are different operational modes of the energy valve. So when it was first installed, it was set to what we call position control. And that means that the valve was responding, the control signal was simply commanding how open the valve should be. This indeed is, is essentially a standard control valve mode. So it was in standard position control mode. And you can see the heat transfer was not very efficient. The delta T's were between five and seven degrees F. After measuring data for a few weeks, the valve was reprogrammed so that it was pressure independent. So in a similar load range, it got now near 10 degrees of delta T. And after a few more weeks, they added delta T management on and were able to tune in 15 degrees of delta T. So mind you, this is the same piece of equipment in the same space, cooling the same, uh, roughly the same loads. In fact, let's take a look at a specific load. Let's just look at 60 tons of cooling. When we did 60 tons of cooling in position control mode, it netted about six degrees of delta T, and that means we used 240 gallons a minute to create 60 tons of cooling in this space. To cool the same space the same amount with a valve in pressure independent mode, we got 10 degrees of delta T and used almost 100 gallons a minute fewer to cool the same space the same amount with the same piece of equipment. And then when we added delta T management on, we got the flow rates down to under 100 gallons a minute. So the net of this is, is that at the end, we were using 40% of the original flow rate to cool the same space with the same piece of equipment, simply programming the valve differently. The valve simply responded differently to the inputs of control signal and delta T measurements, and we were able to cool that space just as successfully. So at this point, we are going to conclude the webinar. I would love to take questions if we have any, and I thank you very much for your patience and your attendance. Thank you, so David. Uh, we do. Scott's going to jump in. Yes. Yes, we uh, do have a number of questions from the audience. We'll try to get to those. Uh, or to as many of those as we can in the little bit of time that we have left. Um, the first question, uh, what is the range of cost for these valves? So the energy valve is roughly about a 20% increase in price over uh, a pressure independent valve that you might put into a system. Uh, so I, I can't quote specific dollar amounts, but you're not looking at an enormous increase over a pressure independent valve. With a static water balancing valve, why does higher uh, differential pressure across valve necessarily result in overflow? Doesn't the control valve maintain the desired flow rate? So standard control valves are operated to specific amounts of opening. So it doesn't matter if you're using a characterized ball valve or a globe valve. If you send it a control signal for 50%, it's going to open the valve that much. Now, if that opening sees 4 PSI, it's going to get a certain flow rate. If it sees 12 PSI, it's going to see significantly more flow rate because the opening hasn't changed, but the pressure pushing on that opening has. And so when we use pressure-dependent valves and balancing valves, we get into trouble by overpressurizing the valve. The valve only works the design flow at the design pressure rate. Do you have a calculator to estimate energy savings from your valves? Oh, that's a really good question, actually. We have a couple of different tools that we like to use. Um, they're really just estimations. Uh, we're not doing uh, advanced system calculations. But Belimo does have a savings estimator tool that is also available for download for free on energyvalve.com. So I would invite people to point to that. And again, if you're familiar with your local area Belimo rep, they can uh, help you with that as well. 
What GPM capacity can they go up to? So the, the largest Belimo Energy valve is currently a six-inch line size valve that will do 713 gallons a minute maximum. Now that valve can be piped in parallel, so we're able to achieve much higher flow rates if required, but it does involve piping two valves in parallel. We control a regular valve based on discharge air temperature, so it compensates for lower water pressure. How is this different than what you are doing? Well, you, well you're, still, you, you're still going to generate a control signal to control the energy valve. In fact, in a well-designed system, most of the time, the Delta T manager will not enact, and the valve will simply be a electronically pressure-independent valve, which is controlling to the control signal, which typically is generated from a leaving air temperature. So there really is no difference. The difference is, is that I'm going to ensure that I'm using the least amount of water possible to maintain that discharge air temperature. How is the PI programming management done? I uh, don't know that I totally understand the question, but if you're, I, I think you're asking uh, if you wanted to change the flow rate, how that would be done. Um, all Belimo electronic pressure independent valves are programmable, and so you can program them to the specific flow rate that you want. And I think that's what you're asking. I apologize if I answered the wrong question. Uh, we have time for a few more questions here. Um, are the cloud services free forever or just for a trial period? Uh, good question. All energy valves that are bought uh, 3.0 this year will be free services forever. Uh, I believe that's the plan going forward, although we could change our minds certainly in years to come. But right now, free forever. Uh, does the energy valve need to be balanced? Uh, no. So just like the pressure independent valves that we looked at in the dynamic, in, the dynamic balancing section, the energy valve is fully pressure independent and does not require a balancing device and does not require to be balanced. Okay. We have uh, time for one more question. Um, what is the most effective way to determine the correct delta T? <laughs> All right. We saved a simple question for last. Um, that's really a very complicated type issue. The easiest way to set a delta T um, is to know what the design delta T is, is of the coil. However, if that coil has some age on it, we might not necessarily be able to, um, to achieve the full delta T. So there's a couple of ways to approach that. There's sort of the guess and check approach. So if, if you have eight degrees of delta T now on, on say, a 14 degree coil, we might set the delta T manager for 10 or 11 degrees, make sure we can hit all our discharge air temperatures, and then you could bump it up another degree and check if that works. Uh, the other way to do it would be to collect a substantial amount of data and then analyze it uh, to figure out the optimum delta T set point. So there's a couple of ways to do it. It really depends on how critical the nature of your space might be that you're trying to cool couple ways to do it, and Belimo is always happy to be involved in that process with you and help coach you through it. I'm afraid that's all the time that we have. Uh, please know that a recording of this event will be available for viewing on demand at hpac.com within the next 48 hours and be available for one year. And with that, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Belimo, for making today's event possible, David for sharing his expertise, and all of you for attending. Take care.